Welcome back. Uh, so in the last lecture, we went over uh, some of the basics of soils and soil moisture and kind of use that as a motivating example and kind of explore some of the concepts of kind of why we're interested in soil moisture and why we might want to try to model it. Uh, in this video, we're going to then dive into kind of some of the, at a high level, how you actually do that using a flux equation known as Darcy's Law. So the key to Darcy's Law is this concept of water potential. So we're seeing that we have a flux equation. So we have flux uh, change in water content uh, with time. And that's going to be in terms of either volume or mass. Uh, it depends on a, a conductivity, a K, very analogous to diffusion coefficient, but this is the conductivity uh, of the soil. And it depends on this spatial gradient of water potential, D psi dz. And I'm using dz here because I'm often going to be thinking about this as vertically moving through a soil profile. And so water is going to move along this concept of, of water potential from high potential to low potential. Uh, but what is water potential? Uh, so the thing that drives fluxes of water are gradients in potential energy. So water potential is a measure of the potential energy of water, either on a, a per unit volume basis or on a per unit weight basis. So when it's in a, a volume basis, it's Newtons per square meter. And when it's on a weight basis, the units are actually meters. So the easiest way to, to think about water potential is to think about one of its key components. So for example, uh, gravity. If we have you know, water in the soil, and uh, some water is high in the soil, some water is low in the soil, they're going to have potential energy associated with that, such that water is going to want to go downhill. Um, and specifically, if we say the potential energy of that water at any particular place in the soil column is going to depend on its weight, mg, and its height. H, MGH, that's just basic physics. It was drilled into all of us in an intro physics course. So if, if the potential energy of that water, the gravitational potential energy of that water is MGH, then we're going to divide that by its weight, Mg, such that the gravitational potential energy is just measured in terms of its height, which is why uh, it has units of meters. So. If that was the only thing that was going on, then Darcy's law would just describe how water you know, moves vertically through the soil as it's pulled down by gravity. So gravity is pulling it down, but it can't just fall, free fall like in the air, because it has to move through all these pores and, that, and there's some conductivity, which is actually a good first approximation for what's happening. The water is moving, being pulled down by gravity and the, there's a conductivity that determines that rate. Uh, but any, the, the reality is that soils are a more complex environment than that. And there's actually four terms that we're going to have to think about in terms of water potential. So there's this first one we've already talked about, gravitational water potential associated with height. Uh, there's also a, a pressure potential. Um, that is going to be usually an external force. So that would be how much pressure does it take to you know, suck water out of the soil if you're pumping it up. So a pump would be a, a source of uh, a, a pressure potential. Um, roots sucking water out of the soil would be another source of a, a pressure potential. Um, you might also be injecting water positively into the ground to create a positive potential. Um, that happens sometimes if you're um, doing systems to remediate soil, you'll be pumping clean water in at one place and pumping the contaminated water out at another as a way of decontaminating soil. Um, so, and, and so that, that, that ability to pump water out of the soil at a well is a pretty important one, as is the ability for plants to extract it. So that's an important term. Uh, then there's this osmotic potential that has to do with how gradients of solutes might be affecting the movement of water through soil. So you you know if you imagine say you're on a barrier island and you've got salt water on one side and you've got you know fresh water in the soil from the rain, uh, 
there's going to be a, a, a movement uh, from the fresh to the salty uh, just because of osmotic forces. And that's the same kind of idea of osmotic uh, forces uh, you would have covered in a, in a chemistry class at some point. So those are all, all pretty easy to understand. Uh, the last one, which is actually one that, that's really important in soils, uh, is the matrix potential. And in fact, for, for a lot of the modeling soils that we're going to focus in this class, it's, we're just going to focus on gravity and matrix potential because we're not going to worry ourselves with uh, you know, salinity gradients or actively pumping water in or out, at least initially. So let's focus on what, what is this matrix potential. So in a nutshell, the matrix potential is due to the uh, tendency of water to ad 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 adhere and absorb to the particles that are in the soil. So you're gonna have these adhesive forces of water sticking to particles, and you're gonna have these capillary forces uh, associated with water that's between two particles. So you have this capillary water in between these two soil, soil particles, and you have this layer of water uh, that surrounds the soil particle. Uh, one thing that's important to note about matrix potential is that it is always negative, and you can think of it as uh, the force that must be applied to overcome or extract uh, water away from these capillary pores. So, you know, what is the amount of, of suction in terms of, of a pressure potential that would be required to pull the water out of these capillary spaces and off of this, these absorbed spaces. So that's what it is in a nutshell. Um, it turns out um, that those forces, that, that pressure that's required, uh, vary systematically with the amount of moisture in the soil. So if, if the soil is really saturated like a, a wet sponge, uh, then it doesn't take much pressure to pull water out uh, from those pores. But as the, as the soil gets drier and drier, and there's less and less moisture left, you're getting to more and more to the water that's hard to pull out. So it takes uh, more, uh, more you know, negative pressure to pull water away um, as the soil gets drier and drier. Uh, and there's a standard model that we use to describe that, given by this equation here which says that our matrix potential uh, at any point and at any value of soil moisture depends on the matrix potential at saturation. So that's, you know, when the water is completely full, the soil is completely full with water. And then that matrix potential changes with this term theta over theta sat. So theta is the, the volumetric soil moisture, you know, the, the meters, uh, uh, square meters of moisture per cubic meter of soil, oh no, cubic meters of moisture per square meter of soil. So as units of meters. Um, so the, 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 what is your current soil moisture relative to saturation? So this theta over theta sat is basically gonna give us uh, soil moisture expressed in terms of proportion of saturation. So we kind of think of that as going from, from zero to 100%. When it's at 100%, your matrix potential is, is theta sat. And when this goes down, the matrix potential becomes uh, more and more negative. Uh, and it's controlled by this parameter B, which is actually an exponent indicating that uh, it doesn't just get a little bit harder to pull, pull moisture away, it gets a lot. Um, and so furthermore, these parameters, this theta sat, so, uh, theta sat, psi sat, and B are all going to vary with soil texture as well. Uh, so to explain that, we can just look at uh, what these graphs look like. So if we come here to 100%, that's saturation. That's where we require the least suction uh, to remove moisture. And even there, we can see that uh, at that, there's still a gradient. So the things that require the least moisture are going to be sand, which makes sense. Um, and then as this is the soil gets more clay, uh, you know, up here to clays and um, clay loams, you require more. So even at saturation, it requires more pressure to pull uh, 
moisture out of a clay than it does to pull out of a sand. And then as the sand, as the um, soil dries out, uh, this uh, amount of suction required keeps going up. Uh, now the thing that's really important to note here on the y-axis is this is not going up linearly. This is actually on a log scale. So it doesn't just go up a little bit. It goes up orders of magnitude uh, as the soil continues to dry. So, so yeah, th this is really quite dramatic in terms of just how, um, how much more force is required to remove uh, water from soils as they dry out. And in, yeah, and on practical basis is, uh, you know, so if this is Pascals, this 10 to the third is a kilopascal, this 10 to the sixth is a megapascal. So most systems are gonna operate uh, below this kind of darker uh, line here around a couple megapascals. It's pretty darn, you know, beyond that is a pretty severe dry condition. So if we put those two things together, we get this overall equation of our, our under in most conditions where we're not actively pumping water or, or dealing with salinity, that our water potential is gonna be the gravitational plus our matrix. So it's gonna be the height, which is a po you know, uh, positive force. And then uh, this negative suction that would be required to move moisture out. So given that the soil properties vary a lot with soil, moisture, with soil texture, I want to take a second to talk about what soil texture is and how we understand it. So first of all, soil texture is generally defined in terms of your percentages of sand, silt, and clay. And sand are our coarsest particles in the soil, things that are between 2 millimeters and 0.05 millimeters. Um, and then there's silt, which is between 0.05 and 0.002 millimeters, and clays are anything smaller than that. And so uh, sand, silt, and clay are, are basically size classes for particles in the soil. And uh, typically we assume they sum to 100%. In practice, you know, many soils also often have um, you know, large you know, rocks or cobbles in them as well. But in, you know, uh, usually when we think about the, moisture, the movement of soil through moisture through the soil, like it's not going through those big rocks. They don't really have pores appreciably. Um, so we're often expressing it as a sum to 100% of the, uh, you know, the fine components of the soil after you've removed you know, the big rocks, any big rocks that might be there. Um, so since it sums to 100%, you can express any particular uh, texture class uh, in a sum to one constraint so we can plot them on a triangle. And so I can, uh, the percent clay is represented by these uh, horizontal line. So like up here, I'm at a 70% clay, 60% clay, 50% clay going across this way. So anything over 60% clay is a clay, but some things that are 50 or 40% clay are also a clay, depending on uh, the amount of sand on this kind of diagonal axis and the percent of silt on the other diagonal axis. Uh, so if you're 40% uh, uh, or more clay, and uh, less than 40% silt and less than 55% uh, uh, sand, you know, then, then you're a clay. And so you can define this across all the different uh, texture classes. And that our, our parameters are gonna vary depending on which texture class we're in. Um, soil texture varies uh, a good bit. It varies at very large scale. So this is a global map of soil texture uh, showing you know, large patterns being driven largely by geological and climatological processes. And uh, so there's a climatological because of the weathering uh, and geological, you know, plate tectonics and mountains and stuff like that. Um, and then it's also gonna vary on finer spatial scales uh, with geomorphological processes. So you, you're going to get, you know, you know, fine things like sands and silts, uh, you know, in, in right riparian areas, and you might have clays and highly weathered areas. 
um, and stuff like that. So, <clears throat> so now we started with a model that had uh, Darcy's law, um, flux equals hydraulic conductivity times gradient and uh, so moisture potential. We then added, started with that simple equation, we added an extra layer of complexity because we then said, we have to calculate the soil moisture potential as a function of the soil, the soil water potential as a function of the soil moisture content uh, and as well as the height. So where we are in the soil profile gives us the height, soil texture and the soil moisture tells us what the matrix potential is. Uh, and so we've added a little bit of extra complexity there. And now I'm gonna add one more wrinkle, which is that conductivity term. Uh, so what happens uh, to soil conductivity as the soil dries out? So if the soil is saturated on this uh, left-hand side, you can imagine that the if water wanted to flow through here, there's lots of paths for water to flow uh, through a saturated soil. Um, by contrast, as the soil continues to dry, and let's say you get down to this wilting point, uh, th there's not going to be much flowing going on because you really don't have many paths for moisture to move along because there's a lot of air in there. So, so in addition to the matrix potential changing with the soil moisture, we also will find that the, the soil conductivity also changes with the soil moisture and generally goes down as the soil moisture goes down. So we can look at a chart here that's very similar to what we looked at with the matrix potential. And so again, at 100% saturation, we have the highest conductivity. Uh, sand has the highest conductivity. Uh, clay has the lowest conductivity with other texture types being in between, which makes sense. Uh, it's pretty easy. If you go to a beach and dump a bucket of water, it drains right through. If you're in a place that's really clay and you dump a bucket of water, you get a puddle. <laughs> it takes a long time for that to drain in. Um, and we also see that that conductivity is going down and it's again going down on a log scale. The equation for conductivity is very similar to the equation for matrix potential. So we have the same idea of satur percent saturation, theta, the soil moisture divided by theta sat, the moisture at saturation. We have the same idea of the uh, conductivity at saturation. That's this uh, y-intercept here. And then we have an exponent that modifies that. And in this case, the, it turns out the exponent that modifies conductivity is linearly related to the exponent that modifies uh, matrix potential because they're both controlled by these pore spaces. And so it's the same B, but now it's 2B plus 3. And why it's 2B plus 3, you'd have to uh, take the hydrology course. We've got one of those. Um, you can go into that derivation. It's not something I want to cover today. So that kind of wraps up what I wanted to introduce in this lecture when I introduced Darcy's law. So again, flux, uh, you know, flux is a conductivity times a gradient. That gradient depends on water potential. Water potential depends on gravity, pressure, osmosis, and matrix potential. Matrix potential depends on water content. Conductivity also depends on water content. So we end up having to kind of calculate the conductivity, calculate the matrix potential, calculate your height, plug those things in, and then we can plug and play on the, the flux equation. Uh, in practice, you know, you, you, your for loop, instead of having one equation in it, now has a couple equations uh, because you have to do these initial calculations and then calculate the flux and then do that, you know, actual water at this point in, at the next point in time is the water right now plus the amount that gets moved. And then we'll kind of dive into that in the next lecture and we talk more about, um, how we actually implement this uh, numerically.